Hello, welcome back to another video of General Chemistry 1. My name is Daniel, and today we're going to be looking at states of matter and atomic models. So we're going to be looking at the physical states that matter can take, as well as defining what exactly matter is. We're going to look at some of the properties of matter, and then later in the video, we're going to be looking at how exactly we got to today in terms of our model for what's inside the atom, what makes up matter. So first off, let's define what chemistry is. Chemistry is just the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. So it's a two-part thing. It's structure and reactions. It's what it is and changes. Now, what we can look at first is the three main phases that we find matter in. So first off, we have solids. Solids are very closely packed materials. They have atoms that are very close to one another. What ha usually happens in a solid is that they'll form these kind of repeating crystalline patterns as you see on the, uh, this picture over here. So, so you see they have a repeating kind of structure. They're very compressed together. They're what's called an incompressible, so incompressible material because they're already pretty tightly packed together. So there's not much you can do in terms of compression. Liquids have particles that are close together, but not quite as close as solids. The main difference between a solid and a liquid is that a liquid is free-flowing. So if I have a block of a solid, let's say, and I try and make it flow, the entire block is just going to move in a, you know, a direction. If I move, shake around some liquid, it's going to freely flow around. And the other important property of a liquid is that it'll take the shape of its container, meaning if I put, let's say, some water in a triangular container, it would form a triangle. If I tried to put a solid in a triangular container, it would just, you know, stay its shape or get crushed up as I throw it in or something like that. So liquids are relatively incompressible as well. You can't really compress water to be any closer together than it is. The last one, then, is our gases. Now, gases are our compressible materials, meaning that we can take a gas and pressurize it, meaning we can increase the pressure and put it in, let's say, a tank and make it so the atoms are closer together and occupy less volume. So gases have their atoms and molecules very far apart from one another, as you can see in the picture on the right here. That's a gas. The other important thing about gases is that they fill the volume of their container, as opposed to liquids, which take the shape of their container. So let's say we have a gas inside a container. The gas is going to occupy the entirety of that container. Whereas if we had a liquid, it would only take up a volume that's limited based on how much gas is in, how much of the liquid was in there. So that's the important distinctions between each. And the most important thing to know is how closely together, how close together each of solid, liquid, and gas is, and different phases. So this is, just an, this is just a graphic saying that we can convert between phases too. So for example, let's say we take a solid like ice and add heat to it. Then it will become water, liquid water. If we added even more heat, it would become steam. So phase changes occur by the addition or removal of heat from a system. And that's also correlated to temperature changes. So we can look at some of the phases, the changing fa the phase changes that occur in matter. So the first one you should be familiar with is melting, and that's just simply changing a solid to a liquid. The other one is freezing, changing a liquid to a solid. That's vice versa. Um, some other ones are vaporization. That's a change of a liquid to a gas. And we also have sublimation, which is a change of a solid to a gas. So both of these are just changing into a gas. And then the last one we have is where we go from to a solid. So we have condensation, which is a gas to a liquid. And we also have deposition, which is a gas into a solid. So the important thing to note here is the direction of some of these phase changes. So for example, we can generally say that the heat in a gaseous species is going to be greater than that in a solid species. So we can kind of put make an order like this. Gas is going to have a higher temperature than liquid. It's going to have a higher temperature than solid. 
So depending on which way the phase transition goes, we can classify it as adding heat to a system or removing heat from a system. So for example, in melting, we're going from a solid to a liquid. So that's adding heat. Conversely, when we do freezing, that's liquid to a solid. So that's going in this direction on top of there. So that's going to be the removing of heat. And you can classify the same way for any other phase transition. You just need to remember that gases have a higher temperature than solids and liquids, respectively. Okay. On that note, let's look at what exactly temperature is. We're going to get into this a lot more when we get into thermodynamics, but for now we're just going to have a nice little introduction to what exactly temperature is. So the temperature is just the average kinetic energy of molecules in a system. So we can measure temperature based on one of three scales. We have Kelvin scale, um, Celsius scale, and Fahrenheit scale. Most of the time what's going to happen in science is that we're going to be using the Kelvin scale. So converting Kelvin just looks like this. Kelvin is equal to Celsius plus 273. So that means that Kelvin and Celsius are on a degree-degree basis, meaning that one degree Celsius change, if we changed one degree Celsius, is equal to a change in one degree Kelvin as well. And like I said, we'll get more into the exact definition of temperature and the mathematical look at it later on in the course. Okay, for now, we're going to switch gears a bit and go into some of the properties of matter. Now first off, there's two things that we can look at. We can look at what's called extensive properties and intensive properties. Now extensive properties are those that depend on how much of a um, how much material is in a system. So for example, if we have 100 milliliters of water versus 50 milliliters of water on the right, we can say that volume is an extensive property because the volume is going to depend on how much water is there. The same thing is going to go for mass. If we add more water into the beaker, the beaker is going to weigh more. So those are both extensive properties, volume and mass. Intensive property, on the other hand, is something that is independent of how much material is in the system. So for example, the density of water, whether you have one milliliter or a gallon of water, is going to be the same I'm at this uh, 0.999 grams per milliliter, roughly. Temperature is the same way, too. So if assuming these started at the same temperature here, then you could have 15 milliliters of water at 100 degrees. You could have 100 milliliters of water at 100 degrees. So intensive pro temperature is also an intensive property like that. If you ever encounter a intensive, or if you're ever asked about what's an intensive or extensive property, just think about uh, does it matter how much of the material is inside this uh, system? And we'll get into some of th we'll get into some more examples of that as we go into the workshops as well. Okay. So now we're going to go into the classification of matter. We can classify matter based on two categories. First off, we have pure substances. So a pure substance has a constant composition, and it can only be separated by chemical reactions, if at all. Within pure substances, we have two other categories. So the first one is our elements. Elements are our most simple building block of matter. They're what everything is comprised of. So an element is something that can't be decomposed by physical or chemical means. It's in its most basic state already. And you can recognize these just based on a lot of times their molecular formula. So for example, oxygen gas is just O2. Example of graphite is just an allotrope of carbon, so that's just C. And then a pure metal would be anything on the periodic table. So for example, like a silicon, terillium, um, iron, anything with just one atom in it. We'll go into some of the uh, periodic table stuff in the next video. Okay, for now, the other pure substance is a compound. So a compound can be broken down into its component elements by a chemical reaction. So what does that mean? So let's...